Here we are. Thank you very much, Diego, for taking part of the FTX Bocconi Talent Challenge. The idea of this uh, coffee chat together is just to give a few tips to the challengers. And uh, it's uh, great to have you as one of our protagonists. So uh, <laughs> the first question for you would be, uh, what is one piece of advice you would give to your younger self living in such unprecedented times as the one of 2020 and 2021? Interesting, the younger self, probably the younger self uh, would do something similar, I believe, which is uh, embrace the change. I mean, I've seen a lot of people are trying to uh, deny the situation and hoping that things would go back to normal very quickly. Uh, I, I do believe that uh, people need to realize that lots of the changes are obviously here to stay there is no going back to a normal and i think that's positive that is positive and uh, and i see so many new innovations so many new way of doing things and the younger myself would have embraced them and go after the new opportunities so i would say that uh, fortunately with aging i have not lost my propensity to take uh, challenges and risks Thank you very much. The second question I would love to ask you is, if you were a student today, what is the kind of uh, key skills uh, you should be focusing on? Or like, let's think about the challengers that have been interacting with you during the week. Uh, if you would have one piece of advice in terms of like, this is the skill you should be working on right now. I believe that uh, some basic features, some basic characteristics are the same, meaning that uh, you want people that know how to deal with ambiguity. And, and let me explain what that means. I still remember my first performance review that Jeff Bezos uh, wrote to me, and I'm talking about you know, several years ago. He said that, Diego, I mean, blah, 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 lots of positive things, but there is one thing that I'd like you to work on. You're too black and white, and the world is not black and white. You need to be able to deal with with ambiguity. And uh, and that's exactly what's happening now. We're in an incredibly ambiguous situation where there is no right answer uh, and there is no immediate right answer. You need to explore, you need to do new things. You got into new alleys. Some of those alleys are gonna be dead end. Some of the alleys are gonna be with a beautiful end at the end of the alley. But uh, the dealing with ambiguity and which means also the capacity of adapting yourself to situation and embrace the situation, which go back to my first answer, is a, is a feature, is a characteristic, which is this is probably not just a, a skill that uh, uh, you learn at school, right? You get the deal with ambiguity is also because you have mentors that are, are, are showing you how to do it. And dealing with ambiguity is not a negative characteristics. This again is a positive one, meaning that if things change, you can change pretty quickly and you have to abandon your fixed schemes. I think quite related to this about ambiguity, it's like, I think it's not being afraid of mistakes. And I think being uh, uh, an expert as uh, yourself, you might have done a few. And I don't know if you would like maybe to share the best mistake you ever made that you have learned the most from. Uh, oh my gosh, how much time do you have? Because I made so many. Uh, I would say that, uh, okay, yeah, this is one of the things that are, are, are I believe are incredibly important. And, and when I joined Amazon, I was coming from uh, a, a background of uh, um, being very, very experienced or building my experience in uh, managing operational challenges, right? And uh, I could define myself, and that's also one of the reasons why uh, Amazon and Bezos hired me was because... I was a good operator. I would operate well. The mistakes I made at Amazon at the very beginning was that since Amazon was very chaotic, and you know, a lot of the alumni will show, well, especially if they go into a startup or a company that needs transformation, they, they, they will see chaos and lack of order. And, uh, and uh, my main objective was to put order to chaos. And what I failed at understanding is that being focused on just putting things in order 
is no way to invent the future. And uh, and and I learned the hard ways, the lessons from Jeff, which you know taught us the fact that it is much worse to make a mistake of thinking small with no risks versus thinking really really big, taking risks and making mistakes. So those were that would I would say the main mistake that I made, which is thinking that with operational excellence and being a good operator, you're going to be very, very successful with the company. That is true for ordinary companies. This is not true for companies that are inventing new things. Okay, This is very interesting that you're bringing this up because I wanted to ask you um, about resilience. I think, you know, this is a buzzword that we hear quite a lot when you want to start a company or even when you are a kind of an entrepreneur. What do you think is the uh, best exercise that you have built to be a resilient employee and generally a resilient thinker? I believe, again, it's a, it's something that you're not born with. It's something that you learn. It's a, It's something that is teachable. And it's teachable because you observe, you watch your boss, your peers, acting that way. And they create an environment where you have all those positive characteristics, including resilience. Resilience is, is the output, it's not an input. It's the resilience is the way that you behave because you've done several things. Dealing with ambiguity, by the way, it's, it's, it's a big, it's a, because if you're too rigid, if you're too black and white, you can't be resilient. And, uh, and uh, willingness to be misunderstood is another one. If you think you're working on the right thing, even though you don't see the short-term results, but you have signals that you're working on the right inputs, like, for example, building customer experience, right? At some point, Amazon was in that situation where the financial numbers, people didn't like them, especially the analyst, because Amazon was investing a lot, was creating a lot of future value, but the markets were not trusting Amazon. But at the same time, our internal metrics were telling us the customers were loving that. So we decided to miss to ignore the financial critics and keep focusing on uh, the praise and the trust that the customers were building towards us. So you're making this uh, trade off. And that obviously helps to build a resilient company because you're you're really, really focused on the fundamental inputs, which are just not the financials. The financials are an output of your behavior. If you're just focused on, you know, optimizing for the quarter, on price earnings, uh, ratios, and all those kind of things, you don't build a resilient, you build a short-term, a resilient business model. You build a short-term business model. I think you are here hedging so many tips in terms of like um, a general, an ingredient to a general formula that can be the one of being a good leader. Maybe uh, something I would love your um, your overview and your point of view on this. Uh, what is the value for you of diversity in uh, big companies? And maybe when you, when you achieved a position of being a leader, how did you keep um, faith, let's say, or like how you were like kind of... Uh, trustworthy with anything that you might have believed in terms of uh, diversity and inclusion, you are not an American, for example, so you were working for an American company. How did you approach that? I think so many challengers that are watching and listening to this today are from many diverse uh, cultural backgrounds, from ethnic, ethnical perspectives, social backgrounds, and so on. How would you make it an asset of your diversity? For example, you being an Italian. Well, I... I... I was lucky to work in an environment where by just the nature of the uh, environment that Jeff had built, diversity was uh, a, an explicit asset, not an implicit, it was an explicit asset. Uh, a good leader always wants diversity of thinking because a good leader wants to be challenged, right? And diversity can come through uh, your uh, cultural background, your social background, your gender background, and it comes to that different way. At some point, what we realized at Amazon, that cultural and thought diversity was not enough. And that's why we, we also decided that in order to get to a higher level of diversity where you include 
gender and you kill minorities, but again, explicitly, not implicitly. Uh, we had to change something and we needed, had to be more proactive in terms of going after and looking for this kind of people. And, uh, and that's where we, we really started putting together programs that were concrete in terms of attracting and promoting people that went beyond thought diversity and there was also including gender and racial diversity. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I know that some people, a lot of people think, you know, but well, what's the point about you need to make sure that you hire good people. Diversity should not be your main worry. You just want to hire good people. And that is a simplistic way of thinking. You, you really want to think about long term. So if you have a long term orientation, you know that in order to make changes, you need to force through new methodologies. And that's one example. At the very beginning, they might not work, but for the long terms, they do work. And I think this is, uh, you know, behind the philosophy of having something like the challenge and the FTX Bocconi challenge, bringing a bit more diverse uh, people at uh, FTM Bocconi. And I know that many other companies, of course, do these kind of programs as the one you were just mentioning. My last question would just be about this point about diversity of thinking in uh, the media industry because of your role at The Economist. Of course, what you discussed during the event with John Thornhill about the media as a very interesting space for future investment and, uh, you know, new things are going to come in this space from a technical and technological perspective. Maybe something that, you know, media are quite uh, accused of if uh, not having a huge diversity of thinking in the way they are presenting content and generally products. What is your view on this? Like, do you have this opinion around, uh, for example, Financial Times, The Economist being uh, not as uh, diverse and uh, global in the way they approach the readership? Uh, I personally don't have that perception. However, I think it's very important to, um, to agree on one specific point, which is medias today are in the business of building trust. I think that's the main, uh, one of the main uh, uh, characteristics of the media business. That's always been like this, right? You wanted to have a trusted place where you can inform yourselves. Now, uh, because of the internet, because of the many things we know, it's really, really, really hard to separate truth from not truth or explicit lies from uh, objective information. And I believe that we, but not just as investors, as consumers of, 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 of information, uh, need to be sure that we build, we refer to trusted sources. And that's what those companies, you meant the Financial Times and the, and the, and the Economist, but you, know, you can mention many, many others, build trust. What happens there? That's, Many times there is, and that's why I am a strong believer of the fact that the advertising model is in the long term a loser, is because you optimize the way you deliver information for the number of views of that information, even with absolutely not very transparent way to attract people to that and the famous clickbait titles and, and the way you do it. And I, I do believe that trusted uh, sources need to have in their manifesto of their um, way they deliver information that they, they, they are not going to be using tactics of attracting advertising to the point that the title of the information might be misleading. So that's, 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 a, I'm, I may be going too much into details, but that's one way of the building trust. The second part is the fact that media no longer compete among themselves. Meaning that The Economist and the FT and The Wall Street Journal and The New York Times and The Guardian and Correa de la Sea or whatever are no longer competing among themselves. They are competing with entertainment in general. And it's about the number of hours, sometimes minutes, that you can get the attention. And if you look at your behavior, you wake up in the morning, you look at 
And sometimes you look at the first newsletter that you get. And what is the Financial Times or the Economist and the New York Times? You got time to read one of them. And the other point is that those companies are competing with Netflix, are competing with Prime Video, are competing with Hulu, are competing with Disney Plus, are competing with ESPN. They're competing for time and attention. And, and that is so exciting to see how this is going to be evolving. I mean, it's uh, the 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 the, fact, the simple fact that you know you are writing. And, uh, and you're employed by Financial Times, but you're not writing an article, you're interviewing me and they were producing a video. That would, did not exist many years ago. Well, not many, just a few years ago. Thank you very much. I think we have everything. But this was a great, uh, very insightful. <laughs> and uh, uh, thank you so much for chatting with me.